ancient, forgotten, unnecessary. The memory of them is slowly fading away and is kept alive only by a handful of followers, weak followers. They were once deities, powerful but understanding, cruel but fair, bloodthirsty but protecting the human race. Their altars follow the humans. They were set up in the first human settlements, sprinkled with blood and gifts. Belief in these gods helped heroes to accomplish their feats and villains to commit their iniquities. Prayers to them were offered in temples, in market squares and at monuments. And then they were deposed, the altars were destroyed, the temples were looted, in their place came others, more necessary to people and more tangible deities. The old gods were dead, long live the new gods. Except they didn't, they didn't die. A god lives as long as at least one of his followers lives. At least one elf, dwarf or human who remembers the deity's name and brings him gifts. Until then, the power of a god does not go away. And until then, he can rise from the ashes, like a phoenix. All that is needed is for this god to be needed by the common people again. The old witcher is here to present you guys the story of the seven forgotten but still powerful deities whose name alone made people's hearts flutter in the ancient times of the continent. Some of them will be reborn, and then all you have to do is beg for mercy. Veopatis Our journey will begin on the mainland, in the forests near the small town of Flodzam. We will remember probably the oldest belief that has survived in the human world, a belief that humans brought with them to the continent during the conjugation of the spheres. The god whose name on their lips many of the first human settlers came to land with, Veopatis, protector and guardian of the human race. At the time of the first human settlement of the continent, Veopatis was a guardian god, his name associated with the protection granted by the river. For it was in the valley of the Ponta River that the human race first set foot on the land of the mainland. The river gave them protection and sustenance. Veopatis also shielded them from the dangers of the forest. The staves with his images marked the boundary between the world of men and the unconquered world of the dark forest. At that time this question was especially acute. Humans had just arrived in a world inhabited by various monsters and relics of the conjunction of the spheres. But they managed to survive. They took back one patch of forest after another. They managed to grow stronger. And they were helped by their one and only god. Theopatis gave people fish, helped them sail and was used to drive away wild animals, and yet he was a self-willed and cruel deity, or rather people were quite primitive back then. For life they necessarily paid with life, for sustenance there was prayer, for protection there was worship. Nowadays, if a traveler wandering deep into the forest comes across stone idols with open mouths, he usually mistakes them for statues of monsters, but these are the statues of Veopatis, the one who is remembered only by the oldest and wisest of the living. Nevertheless, even at these ancient statues, fresh gifts and offerings can still be found from time to time. On the one hand, it is good to see that people do not forget their roots and pass on even a forbidden ancient faith by word of mouth. On the other hand, it is frightening that these people are hiding among ordinary, unremarkable citizens. There is no telling what these fanatics, with such a deep faith in their hearts, will do to placate their god, who is not at all honored nowadays. Nevertheless, the altars of Veopatis remain places of mighty power. Sorcerers, healers and herbalists continue to use their accumulated power to create great magic and spells, even if it requires confronting a horde of ghosts, the ghosts of men who died on the altars of Veopatis hundreds and hundreds of years ago. Crow Mother From ancient ruins in the woods near Flodzim, we travel to the Skellige Islands, to the hidden abodes of the renegade druids. They are few in number, but they share a common faith, traditions, rituals, and a common goddess. They even announced the creation of their own clan. They are the followers of the Crow. The core of the Crow clan are the Druids, those among them who have questioned the beliefs and ways of their circle. They wish to look as far as possible, beyond the unknown, and the Crow clan allows them to do so. At the head of the clan was the oldest and most powerful living Flamenica a creature that no longer resembled a human so much and had many of the features of a crow. Accordingly, she was called the Crow Mother. She found her shelter in the ancient oak tree of Gedini, and over time she began to gather loyal followers around her, those who also had a burning desire to know something more. 
the Druids who have broken away from the rest of the circle went to the mother and were ready to follow her covenants. But none of them, even the wisest, know who the Crow Mother really is. Maybe she's just a woman who can talk to birds, or maybe the spirit of a crow that was imprisoned in a human body, or a powerful crow deity that has been forgotten and has found its home in the body of a Flamenica. How old is she? And is she mortal? The answer to these questions simply did not exist. One thing is known. All of the most powerful druids of the crow clan strive to resemble the wild crows in their own species. With the help of strong offer potions, forbidden elixirs and magics, they try to get crow wings, plumage, hard beaks and other attributes they adore. An important ingredient in these tinctures is the root of the crow's eye, a plant that is mostly found only on Skellige. In many ways, it contains most of the necessary elements to change the human body into a crow's one. It is worth mentioning that these are often druids in the clan who have gone completely off the rails and for whom this place is the only place they are unlikely to be kicked out of, and given the circumstances, their purpose will be sincere and their faith will be fierce. Generally speaking, the Crow clan is just developing. It has existed for a long time, but it has gained a lot of momentum in the recent years and does not have a huge community. However, its followers sincerely believe in the Crow Mother and the way that she will show. They are willing to devote themselves to the service and are willing to do whatever it takes to make the clan grow. Lilith From the Skellige Islands, we go back to the Northern Kingdoms. From a creature of mystery but definitely alive, we move on to a creature of demonic nature and bloody beginnings. Lilith is the scourge of the continent, a deity whose very stories have condemned girls around the world to horrific torment and torture. Originally, the blood goddess was only honored in the east, but over time, the legends about her came to the northern kingdoms, spread there and became a horror tale that had better never have actually happened. This very tale promised that Lilith was dead, but one day she would return to the continent to burn it to the ground. Sounds creepy, right? But no one initially took that creepiness seriously. That is, until a sorcerer named Eltibald took over. A famous archaeologist and antiquities researcher, Eltibald, in his old age, began to make real prophecies, claiming that they would come true. Many other magicians thought him mad, but the common folk listened and were horrified. Digging up and deciphering the first manuscripts from the time of human migration, by studying the records of the Dalk and Vojgor tribes, about whom, by the way, we told in one of our first issues of the History of the Witch's World. Eltibald supposedly found evidence that Lilith would return to this world. The way to the cruel deity was to be prepared by sixty women bearing gold crowns, who would fill the river valleys with blood. Eltibald interpreted these records of ancient settler tribes unambiguously. Lilith's path to the world of the living will be paved by sixty girls, daughters of noble families who were born on the day of the solar eclipse. This thing went by the name of the curse of the black sun, and every noble girl who was unlucky enough to be born during a solar eclipse was considered a cursed accomplice of Lilith who would bring death to the human race. Surprisingly, there were many who believed Eltibald in his prophecy. The unfortunate little noble women were tortured, their bodies dissected for the signs of the curse, some special mutation. And quite often such mutations were indeed found. This only gave the wizards more confidence, and that lasted for decades. After such repressions, Few noble girls survived, but those who succeeded, oh my, they truly became messengers of the goddess of death. Think of Renfrey, the cruel Queen Sylvana, or Dater Adamain. Each had her own unquenchable fire in her bosom. Each followed the path of blood and vengeance. After them, no one knew whether the curse of the Black Sun was true or the folly of the mad Eltibald. People saw examples of violent girls who were not killed in time and their fear only grew. The belief in Lilith, it suddenly began to spread at an incredible rate. Cults of worship and blood sacrifices began to appear like mushrooms after the rain. Behind them, of course, true fanatics were rising up. Eltibald's prophecy had wide repercussions. To this day, the debate rages as to whether it proved true or the ravings of a madman. In all certainty, there occurred a solar eclipse after which many mutated girls were born. Some of them were isolated from society immediately. From whence, the tales of princesses imprisoned in towers atop glass mountains and princes who set out to rescue them. Rumors abound regarding bloody female outcasts born under the black sun and resembling women only in appearance. 
Many say the creatures proved nothing more than cruel monsters. You know, Lilith was originally believed in only by the wild tribes at Vosgor, who, after the great migration of men, roamed the north of the modern kingdoms, in the present-day lands of Kavar and Pavis. The kings of the north killed those savages and took those lands for themselves. But the surviving Vosgor fled to the east, where they mingled with the local population and incorporated their religion into their culture. Thus, Lilith, or Nia in eastern parlance, was reborn in the minds of generations. The worship of Lilith grew into a fairly strong cult, with temples appearing in Hackland and Zericania. In the latter, the cult of Lilith even claimed to surpass in popularity the mainstream Zerican belief in divine dragons. But when it was realized that Lilith posed a threat to all living things, real persecution began against her followers. Even the matriarchal order of Lilith's communities didn't help. The women were persecuted as eagerly as the men. They were forced to survive, to migrate, and they found very fertile ground in the northern kingdoms. The seeds of their sermons that fell into that soil took root and grew very deep. Now they cannot be easily pulled out. In Nilfgaard, the cult of Lilith has grown into a real opposition to the official church of the Great Sun. Despite the persecution, the followers of the deity are holding their positions firmly and are not going to retreat. So if the North should hope that Nilfgaard will collapse from within, it is on the cult of Lilith that they should make the biggest bet. Yes, over the years, the image of Lilith as a goddess has changed. For the Vosgor, she was the god of war. For the Bobalax, with whom the Vosgor fought, she was a satanic bloodthirsty dragon. In the east, in Zericania, Lilith, or already Nia, became the patroness of women in general, protecting them from cruel men, punishing scum who beats mothers and children. Well, in the north, there was a mixture of all these beliefs. And Lilith appears as a woman, but evil cruel and threatening to all mankind. She patronizes her priestesses, but they're also just tools for the end of the world. That's what it all came down to. No one knows what the extent of the cult of Lilith will develop, but the fact remains that the blood goddess, who at one time almost disappeared from the religious radar of the continent, has turned everything upside down. Now her name is known everywhere, and even non-believers say it in fear. And that's worth a lot. Lion-Headed Spider The most unambiguously dark and horrifying religion on this list, but it's also the least studied and the most difficult to understand. Koram Ag Terra, or the Lion-Headed Spider Cult. The priests of this religion have become infamous all around the world. They are able to cast curses of incredible power, have the art of conspiracies, spoils, and can even summon the dark incarnation of their god. In general, they possess everything that ordinary peasants are so afraid of, unable to sleep in the evening clear from the stars and moon in the sky. That's why there are more rumors about this cult than there are facts. But there is definitely something interesting. The religion was probably founded by eight men, Merchant Abrosio in the city of Laredo, and also his associates in Gezo and other cities in the Nilfgaardian Empire. The cult became something secret and forbidden. Even at the very beginning, Rumors for some reason crept fast, even when there was no basis for these rumors. Well, as it often happens, what is secret and forbidden becomes desirable, especially for the rich and noble who are so bored of drinking the most expensive wine with the most expensive food every day and relaxing in the shade of the awnings of expensive villas, conspiracies, bloody sacrifices, hallucinations and cruel rites. It all stirred the blood. The religion of Coram Ag Terra had become a veritable private club of the Nilfgaardian elite. But in the harsh empire, such things could not remain hidden for long. When the royal spies got wind of the growing cult, they quickly sprang into action. It turned out that in Loreto, almost the entire city council had become admirers of the lion-headed spider. The emperor did not trifle with such things. The traitors of the Great Sun were caught and together with a founder named Abrosio, burned. However, it was not possible to catch all the cultists. Many went underground. Others fled to the northern kingdoms and spread the religion there, establishing temples in remote, abandoned places where ordinary people rarely visited. The priests of this faith never advertised their affiliation with the forbidden cult, and it stabilized again. And right under the noses of all kings and emperors, it has grown into a bloody sect. Now it will not be easy to eradicate it. The priests wear black cloaks and blend in with the crowd. Their religion forbids them to carry weapons by which they can be recognized. 
For their sacrifices, they also select only the right people – orphans, disabled people, exiles and refugees. In general, those who are not particularly registered anywhere and whose disappearance will not be noticed by anyone. The priests of a single temple usually refer to their community as a circle, where there are six priests and six priestesses, under the leadership of a single high priestess, which can convey the will of the lion-head spider or appease the deity's rage. All followers of the cult believe that darkness is higher than light, and only darkness is worth serving, plunging everything they can reach into darkness. They believe that fear, terror, hunger, hatred, evil appeared before love, duty, friendship and therefore they are stronger. At the head of everything is chaos and, of course, death. Ordinary people hate and fear the adherents of the lion-headed spider, blaming them for their troubles, dumping lost children on them. The faith of the eternal fire also fights against the bloody cult. But that makes Coram Ag Terra a true haven for outcasts and criminals of the faith. The ranks of the cultists are only growing, and who knows where it will eventually lead. Queen of the Fields We finally get away from the horrible creatures and the people who worship them with blood sacrifices. We move to Doblathana, the Valley of Flowers, and from the conversations of the remaining Ainshade Elves, we catch the name Dana Miabd. The humans call her Queen of the Fields or the Lithia. The dwarves call her Blomen Magde, but every nation knows her. Every race on the continent knows who Dana Miebd is. She is the immortal spirit of nature that existed here before the conjunction of the spheres. The Queen of the Fields is most strongly honored, of course, by the Elves. Nevertheless, the goddess likes to take human form, and through intermediaries, chosen believers, she speaks to all those who honor her and are willing to protect nature. Sometimes she approaches those she is interested in directly, in whom she sees a living beginning. When Slithia treads the earth blossomth and bringeth forth, and abundantly doth each creature breed, such is her might. All nations to her offer sacrifice of harvest in vain hope their field not another's will by Lithia visited be. Because it is also said that there come the day and end when Lithia will come to settle among that tribe which above all others will rise, but these will be mere women folk tales. Because, forsooth, the wise do say that Lithia loveth but one land, and that which groweth on it, and liveth alike, with no difference, be it the smallest of common apple trees or the most wretched of insects, and all nations are no more to her than that thinnest of trees, because forsooth they too will be gone and new, different tribes will follow, but Lithia eternal is, was and ever shall be until the end of time. Sometimes, on a hot summer day, one can see the silhouette of a young woman surrounded by a swarm of butterflies, with a wreath on her head. No one, not even the elven sage, is sure who or what she really is. Some see her as a goddess, others as an embodiment of the forces of nature. One thing's for certain, without her the continent would be as dead as a rock in the sea. It is the Lithia who wakes up the plants and animals after the long winter. She opens the buds of delicate flowers. Where she treads, the earth gives birth to bountiful gifts. Where she is absent, the ear breaks in the wind, flowers wither, and fruit is scarce. By nature, the goddess is cheerful and kind. She rarely shows her face to mortals. She doesn't take part in wars, and only on harvest days she goes to the fields to dance with the village girls. Dana Mia sometimes takes the form of an ordinary woman, and as such lives among mortals. She pretends to be mute and keeps aloof, but watches everyone closely. In those villages where the peasants do not tear poppies and cornflowers among the chickpeas, and where the cows are allowed to eat carrots sometimes, Lithia multiplies her gifts, but where men treat the land not as a mother but as a slave, hail and frost come. Even the dwarves who prefer rocks to fields and forests honor Dana Miebd. They call her by their own name. They don't like nature much, but they still make rafts of hop cones and bring jars of pickled mushrooms to the crossroads, where they carefully place them as a tribute to the goddess of nature. I guess any deity can exist if it has a single follower, but Lithia doesn't even need that. She just exists, like this world, like every blade of grass in this world, and always will be. Not understanding the essence of people, but studying them because they are alive. Not understanding the rudeness of dwarves, but giving them crops, because they are alive. Giving gifts to those who honor nature and punishing those who destroy nature. Dagon 
The underwater world in the which universe is distant, scary and completely unexplored. All we can say about it, it is very dangerous there. Even if you take away from the brackets of huge monsters that furrow the oceans, we cannot help but think of fish people, sea intelligent people with a real army, and it seems it's underwater civilization. And one can't help but think of a powerful deity straight out of horror tales. His name is Dagon, a mythical creature whose existence is unlikely to be believed by any of the great minds of any of the continent's nations. That is not dead which can turn no lie. It was strange aeons, even death may die. Powers older than humanity slumber in the depths, where no sun rays disturb them. Gods and demons sleep in underwater cities awaiting their time, and it is said that when the hour comes, they will awaken and bring annihilation to the world. One of those creatures, Dagon, rests at the bottom of the lake and is worshipped by Vodinoi and lunatics. Dagon is an embodiment of strength and fury, and when he comes ashore, he becomes destruction incarnate. Legend has it that Dagon waits at the bottom of the sea for a special formation of stars. When the fateful day comes, he will come to land and symbolize the world's destruction. Until then, he's just spilling his rough, chaotic nature onto the sea civilization. But his call reaches the land, and the people living in the coastal houses who go mad at the whisper that overtakes them during sleep. They become slaves to Dagon, bringing him gifts, worshipping him. And from that day on, they lose themselves forever. Their goal remains only the coming of Dagon. Rumor has it these days that Dagon is dead, but other rumors say that the deity cannot be killed so easily. He is immortal, and he will be reborn at the bottom of the sea to come and bring destruction to the world. Grief From the depths of the sea, we slowly move to the mainland, and we turn to the most famous cults there, Melitelli, Freya, Heimdall. You've heard all these names if you've played the third witcher at least once, but probably few of you have heard the name of the god Kreev. Those who worship Kreev are representatives of one of the oldest religions on the continent. From the very beginning of civilization, after people formed the first states and forgot a little about Veopatis, there were two religions, the cult of Melitelli and the cult of Kreev, which opposes it. Back then, in those distant times, we had not heard of your eternal fire or prophet Lebiota. Melitelli and Kreev were who reigned supreme on the altars, in the thoughts and prayers of the Northmen. However, if the cult of Melitelli somehow managed to pass the test of time, the cult of Kreev turned into a rather narrow religion in its scope. Nevertheless, the few followers of the deity are indeed fanatically devoted to their faith. In Gaywen, there are still quite large centers of Kreev worship, and in Bearfield, there is still a large temple that has survived all the wars and upheavals. There are still sacred services held there, and people bring their gifts to the altar of Kreev. They need their deity because of it being opposite of Melitelli, urging the followers to fight for morality, honor the sacred right of kings to rule, and make as many sacrifices as possible. More or less, now the reasons for the withering away of the Kreev religion become more understandable and even obvious. Still, with time, people became more freedom-loving, and a supreme being who demands from them unconditional obedience to the rulers would not really take root. For now, the cult still exists, and even has a fairly strong connection with the main modern religion of the witch world, the cult of the eternal fire. For example, the legendary patron and hero of Novigrad, Saint Gregory, was a follower of the Kreev cult. Interestingly, the status of the saint was given to him by the hierarchs of the eternal fire, already after the death of the famous hero. Around year 970, Gregory donated half of his property to save Novigrad from starvation. He traded everything for food from Nazir, and Novigrad was spared many starvation deaths and starvation riots. Gregory did it because of his beliefs, partly because of his worship of Kreev ideals. He was made a saint, however, only in the religion of the eternal fire. This is quite ironic, and it shows that it was from the ancient beliefs in Melitelli and Kreev that all the other cults of the continent grew, even the belief in the eternal fire. Well, we may be getting to the point where you finally give us a like, write a comment about the coolest gods of the continent, subscribe and hit the bell. We hope so. And anyways, thanks to each and every one of you for each and every view. And see you soon, when the old witcher speaks once more.